Hello boys and girls, Tattoo Genius coming back at you. I just wanted to give you a little bit of history about the tattoo ordering process and the availability of supplies. Back in the day when I started tattooing in 1980, there were just, actually there were three major tattoo supply companies. One was more entry level called SMW or Stanley and Walters Tattoo Supply. The next one being Spalding and Rogers which consisted of Huck Spalding and Paul Rogers and then there was the National Tattoo Supply Company. SNW being the entry level, Spalding being the common, and then National being the elite, which you had to be a national member or a national member had to purchase the supplies for you. These catalogs here, this catalog is actually dated 1982. So this was actually the second catalog I got from them. The first one I had loaned to somebody to look at the tattoo designs in it, and so they had never brought it back. My Stanley and Walters catalog I cannot find at the moment. I'm not sure where it's at. Um, I don't know. So we're going to start with this Spalding and Rogers here. We're going to bring this over here. Now this catalog has been a little tore up because it's quite old. Um, this claims to be their 26th anniversary in the tattoo supply market. But even back then, you could buy tattoo kits that would come with pigment, design sheets, machines, um, needles, power supply. And even back then, we used things like green soap, which is, green soap is, is not really used anymore in the tattoo process. Green soap was never meant for a tattoo process, but that, that's for a later date. That's going to be another video on um, things that were used and missed. And, uh, misused and still are misused in tattooing. But the tattoo machines themselves, I mean you can see the tubes on here, how small the tubes are in the in the demo pictures. This was considered the Cadillac of tattoo machines because it was so lightweight. Then we have the Spalding Supreme tattoo machine which I still use to this day. I've had this particular tattoo machine since 1986 and I still use it as a daily machine for a liner so once it's a good machine it's always a good machine. The Puma here I have the Puma which I use for everyday shading I mean it's standard issue once you buy a good machine you don't need another machine you've got a good machine. Back then they used to offer them they had just started offering the little temporary tattoos uh, unregulated power supplies which is, were terrible um, you know just an assortment of the same things you find today but then some differences too like these tattoo machine tube racks which I showed in my first video um, and then some tattoo memorabilia with tattoo machines on them necklaces tattoo artist t-shirts those are so funny just different things. I mean, swivel top projectors before the common person actually had, um, you know, copy machines where a Xerox machine would cost you thousands of dollars back in the early 80s. So this was a, a way to reduce and enlarge and hand draw tattoo, tattoo designs. Uh, footstools which threw your back out of whack. Different stainless steel tubes. Back then, we, you know, you would use a three needle liner bar and um, a six flat shader or a 14 needle round shader, what they called a round shader. But shaders are not round, shaders are flat. Liners are round. So, you know, using these things, you definitely had to be a professional in this, you know. Look how bad this thing is falling apart. This is crazy. But then we get back into the actual tattoo designs and you would buy the design sheets. These were samples of the designs and you would buy the design sheets and they would come into 11 by 14 uh, hard cardstock printed sheets and just black and white and then you would sit down being the artist and color them in to your color choices. And those would be the designs that you would offer to the customers coming in. Now this one is 1988 little more updated view of the pictures and stuff you know we actually got you know some fish scale tape on the coils to make them shiny and to get the engraved machines and the, the turned into the quick change uh, different types of frames to get the tubes on and off 
the power supplies were being updated the kits got a little more intensive as far as you know dry heat sterilizers which are good for killing lice on combs and scissors that are really not meant for bloodborne pathogens but you'd even get like a little gold foil certificate saying you're a tattoo artist and you'd fill your own name in on it you know the foot switches started being upgraded you know the the frame designs and choices would would start being upgraded you know the the needle selection started to become a little more a little more wide uh, six needle flat shader was the largest shader that we used back then the large the large more than six flat shaders didn't come start coming around until the late 90s um, it took that long for like the 11 mag shaders and 13s and 15s to actually come around but you know to be a tattoo artist in these days you actually had to be a trained skilled craftsman it wasn't just like buying things you know buying a kit off of eBay with an instruction manual you know that some guy in China wrote that's never done a tattoo in his life this was actually a skilled process so I just want to share with you some of the different things or ear piercing kits you know tattoo artist memorabilia and you know merchandise they still had the tattoo artist shirts, naturally. Books and things. Uh, the choices of colors really started expanding around 1988. So it went from just a few, you know, 10 different colors to cosmetic color charts and uh, stay glow colors, things of this nature. Now the tattoo designs themselves had not changed yet. Uh, into this period of time they had with some people like an artist named Greg Midas who was doing a lot of innovative tattoo designs but they, it wasn't highly accepted because while well, the traditional was the eagle and the skunk and the bluebird and the parrot you know that's just standard issue early tattoo design stuff so then we would get like little in between flyers this one's from 1985 you know introducing a new artist uh, this one's just the cover of a catalog that's long since been gone. Um, I'm not even sure what year this is from. This is probably from the late 80s. And here's a National Tattoo Supply catalog, um, which would give you order forms and such. Now, they all offer the same basic things, but National just went about it a little more professionally. And National would actually only sell to qualified, um, skilled tattoo artists like here um, national actually went into the nine flat mag and the 15 flat mag these two here um, later on uh, this catalog is dated 1999 so like like i said the late 90s the wider mags were starting to be introduced uh, to aid in the fast coloring of things now there were no curved mags yet there were only straight flat mags so these catalogs here, you know, this, this in 1999 they really updated and upgraded things as far as you know bottle racks, you know, you know different ways to hold your pigment, different needle jigs. Yes, we actually used to make our own needles. Um, you did not ever buy pre-made needles. You could buy pre-made needles, but they were very expensive. <laughs> I mean, they would cost you five dollars a needle. So, if you would make them yourself, you were making them for pennies a needle. So you would buy the needle bars, you know, and then you would buy the actual needles themselves, put them together in, in with jigs, which the jigs are, the jigs up. <laughs> I don't know where the jigs are at in here. Different size springs. So you would actually have to know how to tune your tattoo machine. Thermofax units for actually making um, stencils with. And then they would have a different assortment of design sets and design sheets. Some of the same, some different, some redrawn by other artists. Uh, but this is just a little brief history about the, the tattoo process, about how you would get your equipment. And you know, like I said, in order to do this, you would actually have to be a skilled, trained craftsman because you would have to mix your own pigments from dry powders. You would have to make your own needles. 
you would have to tune and build your own tattoo machines. You may even have to actually build and design a power supply or know how to work with the 12 volt electrical factors of attaching rheostats and foot switches and how to make them conductive. So tattooing has definitely come a long way and um, I really enjoy this art. This is why I'm doing these videos. Uh, the next section on this is going to be needle groupings. So stay tuned boys and girls and um, remember to keep slinging the ink.